Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another Musical Jewel Box with the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia. We are here today talking to a music director, Dirk Brosse, about his life in film music, about the differences between concert music and film music, and the ways that there are not differences, which is to say similarities between film music and concert music, and the types of approaches he takes when he is our wonderful conductor and when he's sitting long hours working at his desk talking to directors in every country in the world. So, Dirk, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us again. Yeah, good to see you back. Yeah, hi. Um, any, any updates since the last time we talked to you about how things are going in Belgium? Oh, actually, yes. Uh, <clears throat> there were some artistic updates. So I was supposed to have uh, my celebration uh, concerts last week which didn't happen because of uh, Corona and COVID, of course. But um, we did a live stream concert with some of my smaller compositions. Um, the number of musicians we could get in the concert hall was uh, maximum 45. So we uh, recorded a new album with uh, works I have composed the last couple of months, years, a smaller orchestra. And at the same time, we did a, we did a live stream. And it, it, went, it went very well. I mean, it was a bit, a bit awkward, a bit unusual to uh, perform in front of an empty concert hall. Um, was was a bit, bit different. We were all in a concert dress, and there were cameras everywhere, and we were acting as we were playing for for a public. And I, I was trying to tell the musicians, well, listen, um, try to play for the people that are going to to watch to watch you in their in their homes on their on their on their screens on their tv screens but still it was was very difficult to um, to get the right spirit into the group but i think at the end we we succeeded uh, recording 50, 50 minutes of uh, new music <clears throat> so thinking about film music i figured i wanted to start right at the beginning right at the source of uh your life in film music. And so whether or not we've talked about it before, I think it'd be helpful to get a little bit of background on where did you come to classical music? Did you come from a family of musicians? Did you go to a conservatory looking to be a film composer? Did you think that you were just going to be a conductor? Where did, where did film enter your life and, and how did that lead into your adolescence and early years studying? Well, I, I'm, I'm the oldest child of uh, five children coming from a, a, a non-musical family. I was the first uh, a child to study, study music. And I remember uh, on a, a Monday afternoon, my father and myself were looking at the Dutch TV. There was a program uh, of young children playing musical instruments. And there was a young boy, he was eight years old, and he was playing a, a famous tune, Italian tune. Uh, on the on the trumpet, and um, I was at the moment uh, itself. I was so in love with the, with the sound of the instrument that I, I asked my fa father, "Please, I would like to go to the music school. I, I I want to play the trumpet." And he said, "Yeah, but you're already doing sports, and you already go to school. And you have so many side activities. Are you sure?" I said, "No, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do." So I went to the music school. I picked up the trumpet, and. For one or another reason, I mean, for me, it was so, so natural. Actually, I, I still have the impression that I, I never really studied music. I mean, everything that I, that I was reading, that I, that I, that I picked from my, 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 my teachers, that, that my teachers told me, it was all very, very organic and very, very natural. So I went to the music school, and then I went to the music academy, and then I went to the conservatory. But at the age of 12, at the age of 12, um, something happened, something happened. I went to a concert um, of uh, a, a friend of mine, actually, a, a person who became a friend of mine later on, is somebody who's 20, 25 years older. His name is Francois Glorieux. And he gave concerts uh, for young people, like what Bernstein did in the US, he did in Europe. And um, I went to one of his concerts and then I was electrified, really. I said, oh my God, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So at the age of 12, I knew I was, I, I was actually a, a composer and, and a conductor, although I had no idea what it, what it was being a professional uh, conductor. And then I went to middle school, et cetera, et cetera. So at the age of 18, I went to the conservatory. By that time, all my sisters and brother, and even my father, they took music lessons and they all 
they all went into into music as am amateurs. So actually, except for my mother, who is actually a good singer, everybody is in uh, is in music. Um, I was there big example, the big brother who, uh, who, who started with, uh, with uh, following his passion and everybody followed me in, in, in a way. And, um, and then it, it was very serious when I went to the conservatory and I had to decide so in which instrument I would take. I would, I would, I would like to, to, to continue. And then it was or the trumpet or the double bass or the piano because I played three of them. And I went to the, I, I did entrance exam and I succeeded for trumpets and for double bass. And um, I graduated very fast. I mean, at the age of 19, 20, I, I was done with the trumpet. And then I did audition for the uh, local opera orchestra and I became uh, a trumpet player in, uh, in the local uh, opera orchestra. And uh, after two weeks, I, I told myself, listen, you're not gonna do this for the rest of your life. It's a great experience as a, as a, as a young child, 19, 20 years old, making some, some good money, some good pocket money, playing in an orchestral uh, environment, in a professional orchestra, playing opera, which is great. And um, so after a year, I, 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 I quit the, 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 the orchestra. And then I started studying again, music theory and conducting lessons. And these conducting lessons brought me to Brussels, to uh, Holland, uh, to Paris Conservatory, to, uh, to Vienna, Vienna Music Hochschule, and finally, I ended up uh, studying opera conducting in Köln, and I did this for three years. So I was meant to become an opera opera conductor. And actually, in real life, I never never conducted opera. I during my studies, I conducted many many operas, but um, for one or another reason, it turned out in a different uh, direction. And. Why, why the love of film music at the age of 16 for the very first time? I heard the very first soundtrack of John Williams that he wrote for, for Star Wars. And I was really, I was blown away. I said, oh my God, are there still people living today who are able to write such a great symphonic scores? Wow. And I was so inspired by, by, by this soundtrack that I, I, I was in love with it. And I said, this is, this is what I, what I want to do. <clears throat> And when you, when you look at, because uh, you've done a lot of concert music before, when, you, when you're beginning a project and it's either going to be for film or it's going to be for the concert hall, what are the different considerations that you have when you're even just in the beginning planning stages of how you're going to decide how long it needs to be, what the melody should be like, even the instrumentation? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, I, I don't I don't consider myself as 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 a, a, a multimedia composer or a musical composer. Or I think I, I consider myself as a composer. And the the process is always the same. If I write a concerto for clarinet, or I write a musical comedy, or I write for film, it always starts with the with the music. Of course, if you write for for, for opera, you have to follow the scenario, you have to follow the, the singers, you have to follow the dramatic lines, you have to follow the director, the, the librettist, the scenarist. It's the same thing for, for film. If you write for film, you have the story, you have the, the, the time frame, um, you have the, uh, uh, the, sometimes the dictatorship of the, of the film director who, who tells you, I want this and nothing else, I want this, I want this. You have that horrible time track a time track is um, is uh, when the film is done. Then uh, the, the the film director and the producers they are calling a, a kind of music director, and his task is to find existing music and put it under the film, just to see whether it works or not. And that's what we call the time track. And then when everybody is in love with the temp track and they're convinced that this is the right music, the right direction of the music, it goes to the composer. But by that time, they're so familiar with the temp track that they can't think of anything else anymore. And then they ask a composer to make a kind of blueprint of what's on the temp track. And this is why a lot of composers cannot use their own uh, uh, fantasy and they have no liberty to write their own music because they have to follow the, the, the temp track. Personally, I always try to, to avoid the time track and I try, when I work for film, I try to write the music before the film is even finished. And there are a couple of people that are doing uh, 
following the same procedure. Um, one of them is, is, is very well known, Ennio Morricone, who wrote the music for more than 500 TV films and feature films. He never wrote the music after the music, after the, the film was shot. He almost never watched the movie. He had a meeting with the director, he read the script, and he wrote the music. And there is a, there is a, a, a great example. Um, when he wrote the music for, for The Mission, one of the great movies uh, uh, directed by Roland Joffe. Roland Joffe, who's a, a British director, went to Rome and first of all, got very many difficulties to get in touch with Morricone because he's a very busy man. He doesn't speak any French, any German, any English. The only language he speaks is Italian and very fast and very fluent. So it's very difficult to communicate with him. So Roland, at some point, got an appointment with, uh, with Ennio, so he saw him in his apartment, and he was telling the story. He said, this is a story about a priest who is going to South America, and blah, 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 blah. So he was, he was very inspired. And uh, Roland said, well, uh, it, it would be nice to have a mixture of classical music. I, I would like to have uh, um, ethnic music as well, some, maybe some ethnic singing, maybe some ethnic percussion. And Moriconi was just listening for one hour. He said, yeah, okay, let me think about it. Three weeks later, Roland Joffe received a phone call from Ennio and said, Roland, 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 uh, in Italian, of course, with a translator. And he said, yeah, 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 um, um, the music is ready. And Joffe said, hold on. I mean, I have to shoot my film in a year from now. The, uh, how can it be that the music is ready? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Come to Rome, the music is ready. So Roland flew to Rome, and it was the most amazing, beautiful score, in my opinion, ever, ever written for, for a film. But then there was a problem. It was a beautiful melody. It's called Gabriel's Oboe. Da 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 di di da di da di di da di da di da 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 di da 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 di da 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 da. A beautiful melody. And Roland said, "Listen, I." There is no room for, for a hobo solo in my, in, in, in my film. But he was thinking about it. He said, it's so beautiful, this melody. So he changed the script. He changed the scenario. He changed the libretto. He changed the script. And this is why in the film, in the middle of the film, we see in the middle of nowhere on a small boat, we see a, a, a Western priest playing a hobo in the Amazon. Where is the oboe coming from? And, and he plays the hobo in, in a really a, a, a beautiful, fantastic way. So just, just to, to, to give you the example that um, some composers write the music before uh, the, 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 the shooting of the film is started. I can't imagine how difficult it is for the editors of the film then when they're going back through to say, well, I guess this is how we're going to make this scene work because this is what the music says this is what the music says to do. Now, a lot of, um, not a lot, um, some composers like John Williams who write music for film end up conducting the score. I think Howard Shore for the Lord of the Rings series also did something similar. Have you ever conducted the score for the films or television shows you've worked on? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. I have to say that, that um, composer conductors uh, became aware about the power of the music in, in, in a concert uh, environment. Um, and to a certain degree, I believe that certain composers, when they start writing for a film, they are taking into account the possibility of the afterlife of the, of the music, because not all film music can be performed uh, in a concert configuration while not seeing a movie because sometimes a film composer is really asked to accompany a certain atmosphere in the film using as less melody as possible, as less rhythm as possible, as less harmony as possible. So just like soundscape-ish accompaniment of, of, what we, of what we see, just to underline the, 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 dramatic, the dramatic line. Um, so let's say in a feature film, depending on the country, depending on the style of the film. But average in a feature film that takes 90 minutes, there is like one third of music, uh, 30 to 40 minutes of music. And, and, and maybe 60, 70% of that music is accompanying the film. And only 20, 
uh, you, you have you have the 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 opportunity to to show your skills as a as a composer and um, I conducted many many live concerts where the uh, film is shown on a big screen the orchestra is in front of the screen and then the score is played is played live and um, I did a lot of uh, a lot of Star Wars films I think I, I did I did all of them uh, they have a lot of a lot of music it's almost the entire time uh, music, which is a, which is an exception. I did many other other films. I did all the Chaplin films, all the the, the, the Charlie Chaplin films. So the silent films accompanied with uh, with uh, with music. And there you discovered how actually how few thematic material there is. Once in a while you hear some bits of melodies and. Uh, maybe some bars, a couple of bars, but you never have the, the opportunity as a film composer to, to show your skills, like writing a piece of music that lasts for at least one or two or three or four minutes. Huh? Uh, it's only at the opening credits and mostly in the end credits, that, and the longer the end credits, the more interesting for the composer that he can really, really develop develop the, the, the themes. For example, I give you an example. At the score of, uh, of E.T., we have, we have a wonderful theme, which we hear here in, 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 uh, in its complete form for the very first time during the, the end credits. Because during the film, there's never an opportunity to hear the, the entire theme uh, in its uh, entire, entire shape and entire, entire form. As a small anecdote, thinking of John Williams, Star Wars, and E.T., I one of my favorite things to shout out when I'm watching E.T. is that there's a scene uh, where they're working, walking around in Halloween, and a child walks by dressed as Yoda, and John Williams throws the Yoda theme from The Empire Strikes Back into the middle of E.T., which seems like a really fun thing to do if you get to move, work on this many films over a whole career. No, he's a, he's a great, uh, he's absolutely a great, a great, a great master. But I think that the, the, the most important thing for a film composer, I think, is to get to know and try to discover what type of music you should write. So as a film composer, you have to understand the art of filmmaking. You have to have a film culture. You have to watch as many films as possible, great films, uh, historic films, drama films, good films, bad films, series, TV series. Um, because if you don't have, if you don't have uh, that film culture in your DNA, you will never be able to develop your, your personal style. Unless there are hundreds and thousands of composers um, that use the temp track and everybody is copying everybody. This is, this is the problem of today. I mean, we have, a, we have a, a, a certain style developed by a person called Hans Zimmer, who's a great music producer and a, and a great composer, but he, he changed the uh, complete concept of uh, writing music for films, because for him, a film score uh, consists of music, but also of the sound track. So he's incorporating, if you want, all the sounds you hear during the film in his score in order to avoid that you write beautiful music and all of a sudden there is like a horrible uh, noise coming in destroying your, your, your score and, and and he was great in doing this so he, he kind of invented a, a new style of writing and a new approach in, in which he was the first and, 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 and he's the best but what we see nowadays a lot of films are time tracked with music by Hans Zimmer. That means that all those young composers and less young composers are copying the temp track. So it's copying the copy from the copy from the copy from the copy. And at the end, everybody is doing the same thing and it became crap. Nowadays, a lot of scores just became crap. On top of that, today you can, you can, you can buy the very specific uh, sophisticated software with pre-recorded layers and everything. You just push with your finger one button and you get if you want to change it from D minor in E minor, you just push another button and if you want to slow the tempo, if you want to fast the tempo, etc, etc, etc. Of course, intelligent uh, composers who have a lot of talent can probably use the same 
pre uh, prepared uh, layers and then do the, do their own thing. This is the difference between the real composer and the genius composer and the one who is just making making a cheap uh, uh, bad tasting uh, uh, musical pizza, you know. And um, yeah, uh, but this you you can find in all forms of of of, uh, of arts. And I think there are a couple of people that really stick out really stick out. You have in the old school, of course, you have John, John Williams, but Jerry Goldsmith, uh, Bernard Herrmann, uh, uh, many of, the, of those people in the generation uh, between the two wars and after, after the second, second World War. Then you have the um, synthesizer generation, the, the Vangelis uh, generation uh, that lasted for maybe 10 years, 15 years, because people thought, oh, let's get rid of the orchestra. Now we have one player who has a couple of synthesizers and he will make the entire entire film score and, and uh, we can save a lot of money. And thanks to John Williams with the Star Wars scores, he brought back the symphony orchestra to the world of, uh, of the film music. And nowadays we have very interesting people, very interesting people because nowadays more and more scores are a marriage between acoustic generated sounds created by the symphony orchestra and in combination with electronic generated sounds and really have, uh, have, have fantastic masters. Um, but again, you have genius people and then you have people who just copy other, other people. Well, I think maybe we can talk a little bit about your scores for a second here. What are the, what are the films and television shows you've worked on that you are most proud of or that you had the best experience doing? There are three three movies I'm I'm very proud of. Um, the first one is is a movie I did um, thirty years ago. It's called Dance D D D A E N S, and it's the name of a of a priest, a Belgian priest, uh, who lived who was born in the nineteenth century and uh, lived throughout uh, beginning twentieth century. He was a priest living in a very poor place, and he was fighting against the establishment in order uh, to give better life conditions for for the working class, in a nutshell. Um, and this was a was a great movie for 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 my country. Everybody has seen it, and generations after generations have have, have seen this uh, this this film. Because if you, if you go, every, every child that goes to school in Belgium, uh, it's on the list of films you have to see. And um, another amazing thing is that this film was um, uh, awarded with the uh, uh, Academy Award nomination for Best Foreign Language Film. We didn't get the Oscar. This went to Indochine, a film by Régis Joannier with the Catherine Deneuve. We were very close. But the fact that this film was uh, 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 nominated uh, uh, for the Academy Award be really means something. And um, that was one of my, 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 my big film scores. And, and to be honest, I, I, I wrote this music before the film was finished. Uh, it has beautiful themes. Uh, it has my musical signature. It's very melodic very melodramatic at the same time because it fits with the, with the film. That was my first big success. And even today, this film, uh, a lot of orchestras still play this, uh, this film score. And um, I'm, I'm very proud I, 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 I've done this. I wrote the music also for Roland Joffe, the one who did the mission and who worked with uh, Morricone. I uh, scored uh, a film and it's called uh, Singularity. It's a story that um, is told in different areas. It's about the past, it's about the present and it's about the future. The, the future and everything, everything uh, happens in the in the mind and in the spirit of somebody who can transform his uh, uh, his brain into the past and the and the future. So it, it, it's very weird, uh, based on on scientific uh, 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 theories, based on sing singularity. So everything that that is, and, and on top of that, it, the story is told in India. So I'm using a combination of uh, Indian local instruments, the sitar, the raga, the veena, the tabla. Then for the future, I'm using computer. I'm using computers, I'm using electronic music. And for the past, I'm using old ethnic uh, uh, Indian instruments. And uh, the combination of the three, sometimes when, when this person again goes into his uh, own, own, own world and own uh, 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 imagination, 
then you hear you hear the, the three worlds musical worlds combines. I'm so proud of this score. I think it's a great it's a great score. I'm really really proud of it. And then last but not, last but not least, I, I I was asked by HBO BBC to write the music for uh, a mini series uh, called Parades End. Um, it's a story uh, about uh, the end of the Victorian area um, at the beginning of the 20th century, just before the start of the of the Second World War, with a major acting of Benedict Benedict Cumberbatch and uh, Laura Hall, uh, Rebecca Hall, um, an amazing, amazing, amazing story, and um, it, it was it was it, 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 it was very difficult. It was very difficult. At the end, I, I got an Emmy nomination for this score, which I'm very proud of. It's the only only department in the entire series that got an Emmy, Emmy nomination. Uh, but it it was a hell. It was a hell. It was really a hell. And I will tell you why. Uh, it was a hell because the producers they changed very often their minds, which is okay. We, we, which which I can completely understand. But the way the way they were talking to me was like. Can you, every time I, I wrote a piece of music and, and we put it under, under, under the sea, he said, good, very good. Could you make it a bit more green? And said, I'm sorry, beg your part. To a painter, you can say, can you make it, can you add a bit more yellow or a bit, a bit more, more blue? But to a composer, I can understand when you say, can you make it darker and brighter? This I can understand. Can you make it cooler or warmer? This I can understand. But can you make the music more blue or more green? I, I don't know what it means. First of all, and second, I'm colorblind, so, so so for me it was like. And at some point, at some point, having made the the complete circle of all the colors, I ended up where I started, and he said, "Fantastic, wonderful." But this happened not one time, but two times, five times. 10 times, 100 times. And at some point, I called my agent in London. I said, Maggie, I'm done. After having worked nine months on this project, I said, Maggie, I'm done. You don't have to pay me. Here are all my themes, all my sketches. Please leave me alone. Leave me. I'm done. I'm completely done. And she said, yeah, Dirk, you know what? I understand, blah, blah, blah. Just go for a walk. And uh, it was a Friday evening. Uh, call me back on Monday morning. So. I called her back. I said, "Maggie, I'm done." She said, "No, you can. You can, no, you cannot do this. We know those people are very difficult. They want to get out. They want to get out the best of, of you. Um, please keep going." And I, 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 I kept going, and I was so happy the day, really, the day I finished the score. I was driving with my assistant to uh, to the studio where we had to record the music for for a week. And we were so happy. We said, oh my God, we're so happy. We have all the music, everything is done. <sighs> wow, it's party time. Recording, conducting, it's party time. All of a sudden, we got a phone call from the BBC in London. Hi, Dirk, this is, and the producer's name, said, yeah, uh, I was thinking last night, could you change the music of the, of the opening credits? I said, I'm sorry, but, I'm on my way to the, I'm on my way to the studio. I mean, we have to record. They say, yeah, but you can record this at the end of the sessions. Uh, you, you can do it during the night, or, or your assistant can do it. But I, I, I would like to change to change again this and this bar, this bar because we thought it's too dark, it's too bright. So there again, when we arrived in the studio, I sent my assistant to his to his room and said, change this and this and this and this and this. But um, that's the DNA of the of the business. I mean, people are changing till the till the very 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 end. But um, yeah, it's a very interesting very interesting world to to work in. Um, luckily for me, I, this is not the only thing I do. Uh, I I love it because I love cinema. I love film music. But I only work for films where I have the liberty to do what I want to do, even if a director tells me more green and more blue. But, but at the end, it's never wallpaper. I would never accept uh, a, a, a commission where people ask me to write wallpaper. Then I would say, no, I, I don't want to write wallpaper music. I, I cannot do it. I, I cannot do it. Maybe, maybe my neighbor can do it. Maybe 
nowadays with the software, my cleaning woman can do it, but I, I, I cannot, I cannot. I, I, I have to be able to, to write music that can also serve as concert music. So if you were to give advice to young composers who thought film music is really where they wanted to be, you might say that you have to follow what you really want to do and not give in to the temp track? Well, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Uh, first of all, uh, I, think, I think as a young film composer, if this is the only thing you do, then uh, lucky you. I, I, would say, I would say try to be a, a composer. At, 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 first of all, try to be a composer um, who is flexible, uh, who has his own style, who can, do, who can write his own music, even if it's for, for one clarinet or two flutes or a duet for cello and, and bassoon. I, I, I don't care. But just try to, 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 to have enough uh, room and space in your mind to create your own things. Then another thing I can advise is try to detect and to develop your own style. I know it's very, very difficult. There are many, many, many people around. I mean, uh, many, many people. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of film composers, especially nowadays with the, with, with, with the software and with the electronica. There are a lot of people who at least think who are, who, are, who are composed. And some of them are very successful. Some people cannot even write a score, cannot even read a score, but they are very successful because they have good ears. And with their ears, they can create very, very, very nice uh, 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 scores. But it, it, depends, it depends what you want. If you want, if you want to, to develop yourself as an artist, you have to find your inner voice and try to be as authentic as, as possible. And this takes years. And when there comes a project where you are asked to make a copy paste of something that already exists, or you can re refuse, or you can accept, but when you accept, try to be personal, as personal as possible. Maybe, maybe you can add something, maybe you can, you can, you can present something in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Um, there are many ways to escape from the, from the, from the temp track and, and, and still stay close enough, but at the same time, try to, to, to use your, 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 your own voice. Now, one of the skills that is very important as a, as a film composer is that you have to be able instantly to write in different styles. If you have to write a waltz or a tango or an Indian raga or a Viennese waltz or maybe something a la Schoenberg or maybe some, something a la Stravinsky or, or, or something that smells more France or Italian or, or Hollywoodian or sometimes those producers and, and, and directors are using a key, a key, one keyword, one keyword, and then you have to understand it. Or if they leave you free, then you have to come up with you have to come up with a with an with an idea, and we come from an area. This is this is why it's very important to understand film culture. We come from an area where composers were asked to paint the red roses red. If you see all those movies made uh, in the interbellum. Uh, what do you see in a, in a big love scene, dramatic love scene, scene, and people kiss and they hug and they kiss and then they cry and they run away, blah, blah, blah. It's all drama. It's all the violence and beautiful melodies, very warm harmonies, big orchestration. So actually, this is an area where you hear what you see. This is gone. This, except for some exceptions, this is gone. So nowadays, Directors want to take the attention of the of the movie much of, of the movie watchers. They want to 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 how would I say? They want they want that you become a, a, a active part of the processes of of seeing what you see, hearing what you hear, and then give you the freedom to fill in what you see or what you don't see or you, what you want to see or what you don't want to see. And therefore, we use the music very often as a counterpoint. So we don't paint the red ro roses red anymore, but we use the music as a, as a counterpoint. But in order to, to, to do this, it's experimental. In order to achieve a good result, you really have to be very smart, very smart. 
because you can not just come up with a counterpoint. So maybe it's a, it's a, it can be an instrument, it can be a chord, it can be a sound, it can be a sample that you used before. So that unconsciously, unconsciously, the public is picking picking this musical element up, and it's it's in it's in the ear. So it's like it's like the little bell of Pavlov, you know. It's it's the same thing. It's actually it's the same thing. It's the light motif that Wagner Wagner is using. He why Wagner is using light motifs. So one of the reasons is his operas are so complex, so many uh, so many different characters that at the end you you don't know anymore who's who is who. So therefore, it helps very much that some characters have a light motif, or some dramatic situations have have light motifs. And um, if if we use this 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 idea in uh, in film music, it can be can be very helpful. But then we are talking about a a different level of writing wall music, wallpaper music, that we really talk in a very intelligent way how to use and influence the music in a very personal way, as it was a, 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 third, a third actor coming from outside uh, the screen and the story. Yeah, well, that is fascinating, and I think that's probably about all we have time for now. Though I'm sure there are, you know, whole doctors. Are we going already? I, I just started. I just started. <laughs> I just started. Yeah. Um, but thanks so much for sharing your experiences in film music with us. Thanks for giving us some behind-the-scenes looks at BBC producers who've driven you crazy, <laughs> which I love. And uh, thanks to everyone at home uh, for joining us this time. And I guess this is where I now address everyone still watching us from their bedrooms, living rooms, or kitchens, wherever you may be, that our Love Beethoven campaign is in full swing. And you can support Beethoven and all the other composers that we bring every time we enter onto the concert stage just by going to chamberorchestra.org slash donate or finding the donate button in the top right corner of our website. And maybe you'll even get to see some more film scores by Maestro Brosse in the future. We just have to keep trucking along with uh, supporting the arts and supporting classical music in the world as it looks today. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dirk, for coming with us. My pleasure. And uh, we will see everyone next time. <laughs>